Hi there, I'm Clifford Bates, and welcome once again to Reading Montesquieu Spirit of the Laws. Today we are continuing in part two of the Spirit of the Laws, we're doing a chapter 10, book 10 of the is that chapter, book 10 of this, which are the laws and their relationship to offensive force. So let's continue. Chapter one. Offensive force is regulated by the rights of nations, which is the political law of uh, of the nation considered in their relation to another to each other. So therefore, the question of force is determined by what he says, the right of nation, which is an international law. Gentum, gentum, yeah. Lex gentum or us gentum. This is the laws of peoples or laws of nations. This is a Latin law. This is therefore, the, this is the political laws that nations have in relation to each other, right? Chapter two on war. The life of states is like that of man. Men have the right to kill in the case of natural defense. States have the right to wage war for their own preservation. In case of natural defense, I have the right to kill because my life is mine. And as the life of one who attacks me is his, likewise a war, a state wages war because the preservation is just, as is any preser other preservation. So therefore the idea that I can preserve my life, they can preserve them, that's why we fight. This is what the, the same thing with states. It was true for people, it's also true for states in this regard. Among citizens, the right to, um, among citizens, the right to natural defense does not carry uh, with it a, a necessary, a necessity to attack. Instead of attacking, they have recourse to tribunals. In other words, they don't, in, some, in other words, the citizens, they don't have, the, the right to defense does not lead to a right to attack in the sense that they, they have a right, they recourse to tribunals. Therefore, they can exercise the, that right to defense only in cases that occur so suddenly that one would be lost if one waited for the aid of the laws. But among societies, the right of natural defense sometimes carries with it a necessity to attack. When one people sees that a, uh, uh, that a, a longer peace would put another people in a position to destroy it, and that an attack at this moment is the only way to prevent such destruction. Hence, small societies more frequently have the right to wage war than large ones, because they are more frequently in a position of, uh, to fear being destroyed. In other words, it's not here is that small, you know, if you're, either, why are you able to attack? Is that you feel you're going to be destroyed? Right? So therefore, larger states are more secure. They have, don't have the right out of fear. They have less right to fear of this. Uh, uh, they, uh, therefore, the right, to, uh, uh, the, the right of war derives from necessity and from a strict justice. If those who direct their conscience or the councils of princes do not hold to these, all is lost. And when that right is based on arbitrary principles of glory, of, pro uh, of, of propriety, or utility, tides of bloods will, will un in 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 undulate, indulate the world, and flood the world. In other words, and, you know, the, the principles of war should be necessity. That is, if people are threatened. But if all of a sudden things are done because of glory, propriety, utility, then... Oh, 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 the world be filled with blood. Uh, above all, let us not speak of uh, of the prince's glory. His glory is his arrogance. It is his passion and not a legitimate right. Mm. It is true that his reputation for power would increase the forces of his state. But his reputation for justice would increase them in any case. Therefore, yes, his, in other words, his the, the danger of, uh, of waging war is that, yes, the p reputation for being warrior to do this, but his reputation for justice would increase it as well. Okay. The chapter three, the right of conquest. From the right of war derives that of conquest, which is, uh, 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 which is the consequence. Therefore, if one should follow the spirit of the, uh, it should follow the spirit of the former. In other words, if you only conquer what you need to, you go to fear of this. Uh, when, the, when a people is conquered, the right of the conqueror follows four sorts of laws. The laws of nature, which makes everything tend towards a preservation of species. The laws of natural enlightenment, which wants us, would, which wants us to do to others as we would want to have done to us. Kind of like a golden law, you know, we would like to do that. We would like to 
we would uh, the, the natural uh, law of natural enlightenment, which which is kind of a reverse Christian, do unto others as others want to do unto you, right? Um, the law that forms political societies, therefore, which are such that nature has not uh, has not limited their duration. In other words, in other words, they are able to do this. Lastly, therefore, the laws of political society that which nature has not limited their duration. Um, and, and lastly, the law is drawn from the thing itself, the acquisition. A conquest is an acquisition. The spirit of acquisition carries with it the spirit of preservation and use, and not of destruction, that of destruction. So therefore, acquisition is what? Is, a pres is the gaining it, to gain something. Therefore, you want to preserve, use it and preserve it, right? Not destroy it. One state that has conquered another treats it as one of these in four ways. The state continues to govern by its conquest according to its own laws and takes for itself only the exercise of the political and civil government, or gives it, or it gives it conquest a new political and civil government, or it destroys a society and scatters it into others, or finally it exterminates all the citizens. Um, the first way conforms with the, to the rights of nations we follow at present. The fourth is more conformity with the right of nations among the Romans. On this point, I leave others to judge how much better we have become. Okay. <laughs> They're searching that the Romans, well, we are bet more better than the Romans. Uh, here, I'm kind of not so sure about that. Leave it to others to argue that. Here, a, a homage must be paid to our modern times, to contemporary reason, to the religion of the present day, to our philosophy and our morals. Therefore, this idea we are better now than the Romans. Uh, and therefore, this is where he clearly distinguished. Um, he, he, Montesquieu's kind of really is is on this modern idea of progress. That he, we have an argument that we are better than the Romans here, uh, because the Romans, would, the, the Romans, the practice of the Romans is something we would not think is right. Uh, when the authors of a pub public right, whom ancient historians provided the foundation, have no longer followed cases strictly, they have fallen into great errors. They have moved towards the arbitrary. They have assumed among the conquerors a right, I do not know which one, of killing. This has, uh, uh, this has made uh, uh, them draw con consequences as terrible as this principle and establish maxims that, are, uh, that the conquerors themselves when they have the, uh, the slightest sense, never adopt. It is clear that uh, once the conquest is made, the conqueror no longer has a right to kill. Besides, it is no longer for him a case of natural defense and of his own preservation, uh, and that of his own preservation. As long as you conquered, in other words, there's no reason to kill anymore at this day. Just say, this is kind of, this is, this, in many ways, this is repeating Locke's argument in uh, on on conquest and in, in, in conflict. There are some similarities here. What has made them think in this way is that they have believed the conqueror had a right to destroy the society. Thus they have concluded that he had the right to destroy the men composing it, which is which is a which is a consequence wrongly drawn from the one principle. For if annihilation of the society, uh, for if annihilation of the society, it would not follow that men, uh, that the men forming that society should also be annihilated. The society is a union of men, not the men themselves. The citizen may perish, and the man remains. In other words, he might remove the citizenship of the human being. You can, you can eliminate the citizen, but not necessarily kill the person. You just remove them of their right, political rights. In other words, you don't have to exterminate everyone. You just have to change the system of legal rights and legal temptation. From uh, the right uh, to kill during conquest, political men have drawn the right to reduce to servitude. But the consequence is an ill-founded is as the principle. One has the right, uh, right to reduce people to servitude only when it is necessary for the preservation of the conquest. The, perp uh, the purpose of the conquest is preservation. Servitude is never the purpose of the conquest, but it is sometimes a necessary means for achieving preservation. So again, 
The purpose of the conquest is not servitude, he argues. Servitude may be a strategy that you must need to preserve your conquest, but there's a difference between the, why you're conquering something and something you, you do. In other words, you don't conquer it to subdue it, to make it subordinate and, and, and for, uh, um, to uh, what do you call uh, a, a servitude. That would be kind of problematic. You do attack it because you're a th uh, it's a danger to you or a threat to you. Or you okay. In this case, it is against the nature of things for this servitude to be eternal. It must be possible for the enslaved peoples to become subjects. Slavery is accidental to conquest. When, uh, after a certain length of time, all the parts of the conquering state are bound to those of, uh, of the conquered state by custom, marriage, law, associations, and a certain conformity of spirit, servitude should cease. So if, uh, the right of the conqueror are founded only on the facts of, uh, that these things do not exist and that there is a dis distance between these two nations and such that one cannot trust the other. Let's see, this is a very interesting point here. His argument is that, okay, permanent slavery would be wrong, okay, and therefore it, that you conquer a people and you permanently slave. But that the problem here is what happens if you can't trust each other? What happens if you have two people who are living together that you can't trust? They, they, they have no distance. They have no, the, the right of conquer is only found on the fact that these things do not exist. In other words, in other words if you have... Uh, 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 customs, marriage, social laws, associations, and a conformity of spirit, uh, 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 and a certain conformity of spirit. That doesn't make servitude does not I mean servitude is problematic in that sense. There's something wrong. But if these do not exist, then you set them servitude may be necessary because these people may be at war with each other in that sense. Thus, the conqueror to who reduces a people to servitude should always reserve for himself uh, 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 means, and these means are innumerable for allowing them to leave it. I am not saying vague things here. Our fathers who conquered the Roman Empire acted this way. They softened the laws that they made in the heat of imp impetuosity and arrogance of victory. Their laws have been hard. They made them impartial. The Burgundians, the Goths, the Lombards wanted the Romans to continue to be a vanquished people. The laws of Yurik, Gunabad, and uh, Rathas made the barbarians and the Romans follow, uh, 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 made the Romans fellow citizens. Now this is, uh, 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 again, notes. The codes of the barbarians in book 28. To subdue the Saxons, Charlemagne deprived them of their free, freeborn status and the own, uh, ownership of goods. Louis the Pious freed them. He did nothing better during his reign. Time and servitude had softened their moors. They were forever faithful to him. So this, again, this is this idea. That, you know, this, 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 this is it. Chapter four, some advantages for the con conquered people. Instead of drawing such fatal consequences from the right of conquest, political men would have been do done better to speak of the advantages uh, of the advantage this right can sometimes confer on the bench people. In other words, it's not about conquering them and you know subduing them. It's advantages. They would have been more sens uh, they would have been more sensitive to the advantages if our rights of nations were followed exactly, and if it were established around the earth. In other words, <laughs> then our rules, our principles should be universal. Then it would make more sense in that sense. Ordinary states that are conquered do not have the force they had at their uh, uh, institution, uh, held at their institution, or, or, uh, uh, corruption had entered them. Their laws have ceased to be executed. Their government had become an oppressor. Who can doubt that where, uh, uh, that where would be gain for such a state that it would draw other advantages from the conquest itself? If the conquest were not destructive, what if what would the government what would the government lose by being recast? If it had reached the point of being unable to reform itself, a conqueror who comes to a people among uh, 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 among whom the rich, 
by a thousand ruses and a thousand tricks have imperpetually practiced an infinite number of usurpations, where the unfortunate man who trembles as he watches what he believes to be the abuses become laws is oppressed and believes himself wrong to feel so. Uh, 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 believe wrong to feel so. A conqueror, I say, can change the course of everything. A muffled tyranny is the first thing w which a, a, is liable uh, uh, is li is li uh, 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 liable to violence. And it was interesting. I say that change the course of everything. The muffled tyranny is the first thing which is li uh, uh, liable to violence. So there were oppressed tyranny as well. For example. One has seen states whose oppression by tax collectors was relieved by the conqueror, who were, had either ne, neither the engagement nor the need of legitimate princes. Abuses were corrected even without the conquerors correcting them. The, frug the frugality of the conquering nation had sometimes put in, in a person to leave the vanquished people the necessities that had been taken from them under their legitimate prince. A, a conquest can destroy harmful prejudices. Uh, and if I dare say, in this way, can put a nation under a better prince, uh, uh, presiding ge genius uh, idea. What good could the Spanish have done for the Mexicans? They had a gentle religion to give them. They brought a, them a raging superstition. They could have set the slaves free. They made freedmen slaves. They could have made clear to them that human sacrifice was an abuse. Instead, they exterminated them. I never, uh, I would never finish if I wanted to tell all the good things they did not do and all the evil ones that they did. So the, the Spanish are bad role models. The Spanish, when they, they did it in the world, was a was, was, was example of the bread. Again, I mean, this is the point. This is what uh, someone like Modest would say. The reason why the difference between the culture of the North and America, Latin America, is the Spanish conquered this Latin America. And with the Spanish brought brutality, viciousness, and then, oh, but they both killed the Indians. Well, the Spanish were more vicious. Um, the North America, the, the, the Indians in North America, yes, they died, but they mostly integrated into the society. And by integrate, I mean married into it. Um, it is for the conqueror to make amends for the part of the evils he had done. I define the right of conquest thus a necessity, legitimate and unfortunate right, which always leaves an immense debt to be discharged if human nature is to be repaid. So that, now he's going to give an example from the past, chapter 5. Gleon, king of Syracuse. The finest peace treaty mentioned in history is that, I believe, the one... Elon made with the Carthaginians. He wanted them to abolish the custom of sacrificing their children. Remarkable thing. After defeating 300,000 Carthaginians, he exacted a condition useful only to them, or rather, a stipulated, uh, he, uh, rather, he stipulated one for mankind. So therefore, this is, uh, it's the Carthaginians were sacrificing their children. Gilon, when he conquers, the, defeats the Syracusan, the deal is that you have to stop that practice. It's a very interesting uh, 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 thing here. The Brachians had their elders eaten by large dogs. Alexander forbade them to do this. And this he was, was a triumph. He, uh, this was the triumph he gained over superstition. Chapter 6. On a republic that conquers. It is against the nature of things for one confederated state under a federal constitution to conquer another, as we have seen among the Swiss in our own times. Mixed federal republics with an association of small republics and small monarchies, such a, 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 a conquest is less shocking, therefore. A mixed federation of pure, in other words, if everyone has the same thing, confederated thing, where everyone has the same thing like the Swiss, unlikely. Mixed with the association of small republics and small monarchies, that is perfect. It is also against the nature of things for a democratic republic to conquer towns that could not enter the sphere of democracy. As the Romans had established from the beginning, the conquered people must be able to enjoy the privilege of sovereignty. The limits to conquest should be to, to be the number of citizens fixed for that democracy. If a democracy conquers a people in order to govern 
uh, it, it as a subject, it will expose its own liberty because it tr uh, will entrust too much power to the magistrates whom it sends out to the conquering, conquered state. What danger would uh, 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 what danger would not the Republic of Carthage have run if Hannibal had taken Rome? In other words, that's why the uh, in other words, oh my God, if Ca Hannibal conquered Rome, it would threaten the power of the Republic and that. Having caused so much revolution in his own town, in his own town after the defeat, what might he not have done there after that victory? Uh, this is note six. As he was a head of a faction, that sounds right. Hanno never held. Uh, 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 um, Hanno could never have persuaded the Senate not to send aid to Hannibal, if he had not, uh, if he had not. Own uh, had, sorry, if he had let only his jealousy speak, that Senate, which Aristotle tells us, was very wise. Something the prosperity of republics prove, the prosperity of the public proves well, could reach a decision only for sensible reasons. One would uh, one would have had to be dull witted not to see that the army, the an army three hundred hundred leagues away, had. Uh, had necess necessary losses that had to be repaired. Hanno's party wanted Hannibal to surrender to the Romans. At that time, one could not have feared the Romans. Therefore, one feared Hannibal. Hannibal's successes, they say, could not be believed. But how could they be doubted? W were the Carthaginians scattered around the earth, unaware of what happened in Italy? It was because they were aware of, what, uh, of it that they did not want to send help to Hannibal. Hanno became the uh, became firmer after Triba, after uh, 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 Tyrannesa, after Cana. It is not uh, their incredulity that grows; it is their fear. In other words, this idea that, that Hannibal's greatness caused the Republic fear because that, that great power, that thing, would be could lead to the destruction of the Republic that degraded it. That's why democracies, small democracies, mid-sized democracies, republics, have you careful about military leaders. Military leader, and this is what the idea that he becomes a big great conquest overseas. The great conquest overseas would then lead to maybe him coming here and saying, I want to, I want, I'm powerful, I have an army, obey me. Again, isn't that Caesar? Isn't that Pompeii, Caesar, and the problem of Rome in that sense? Chapter seven, continuation of the same subject. There is still another drawback to conquests made by democracies. Their kind of government is always odious to subject states. It, it, it is monarchical only by, a fi by fiction, but in truth, it is harsher than monarchy, as experienced of all times in all countries has shown. In other words, this is what, you know, this is the idea. This is why America, America cannot be really a conqueror. It's too, it, it, it's, it, uh, um, it's, it's, when America tries to conquer somebody or does something like this, its rule is odious. It's worse than terror, but monarchies. Maybe that's the, maybe we should have let the British Empire keep the, the British monarchy keep the empire and keep all those people in check. You know, 1945 instead of you know democracies thinking that oh these people can be democrat. No, 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 no. Maybe it would have been better to leave a monarchy in charge or something and let them because the American democratic people doesn't. Montesquieu seems to suggest that a democratic republics cannot even confederate republic. Cannot really tolerate being a you know conqueror or ruler. It just corrupt. First of all, it danger it endangers the republic because it creates powerful people who threaten the republic. One, and maybe the industrial military industrial complex that threatens it. Right. Then the second thing it does is is that it you know it's odious to the people that are conquering. Right. The conquered people are in a sad state. They enjoy their advantages neither of the republic nor of the monarchy. What I've said of popular state can, be, can be applied to aristocracy. I'm going to say now, subject. This is chapter eight, the continuation of chapter eight. Thus, when a republic holds the people dependent, it must seek to make amends for the drawbacks that arise from the nature of the thing that gives this people a good political right and good civil laws. That arise from the nature of things that give it, that that by that thing by giving this people. Or if you're going to not, if you're going to hold the people dependent, you must uh, draw back of this dependency by giving them 
good political rights and good civil laws. An Italian Republic, an Italian Republic held certain islanders obedient to it, but its political and civil rights in these regards were faulty. One recalls an act of amnesty that stipulated that they would no longer be condemned to corporal penalties on the uh, on the uh, pr uh, privy knowledge of the governor. Yeah, corporal penalties are uh, uh, imposed. In other words, it, it, it meaning imprisonment or death. Corporal uh, are penes, and uh, so therefore these were not going to be in the governor. Um, the act of amnesty. What this is the of eight seventeen thirty eight printed in Genoa by Francelli. We forgive our general in the said island of Corsica to condemn to grievous punishment any person based solely on his own privy information. Uh, 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 he will certainly be able to arrest and imprison such persons who are suspect, provided they they uh, 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 that he renders to us a speedy account. Right. This, this. Okay. People have often asked uh, uh, for privileges. Here it, 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 here it is the sovereign who grants what is the right of all nations. In other words, so therefore this idea that here the people have asked for privileges, therefore it is here, it, 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 here, it is, here it is the sovereign who grants what is the right of all nations. That is the right to what? That they are, you know, that they benefit, they're getting benefit, the goods of their rules. In other words, the rule, rule is supposed to be benefiting people, must be giving them good order and good uh, benefit. If it's not doing that, then it's... Chapter 9, on the monarchy that conquers its neighbors. If a monarchy can if a monarchy can have an influence long before its expansion weakens it, it will become formidable, and its force will last uh, as long as the neighboring monarchies continue to press it. Therefore, it should conquer only to the limit of its na uh, to the limit natural to its government. Prudence want it. Prudence wants it to check itself as soon as it exceeds these limits. It is a sort of conquest. Uh, it is a sort of conquest. Things left. Uh, things must be left as they were found. The same tribunals, the same laws, the same customs, the same privilege. Nothing should be changed but the army and the sovereign's name. When the monarchy has extended its limit by the conquest of a few neighboring provinces, it must treat them gently. If a monarchy uh, that has worked long for a conquest, the province of the first domain will ordinarily be badly trampled. They uh, have to suffer both the new abuses and the old ones, and often a vast capital that engulfs, and often a vast capital that engulfs everything has diminish their population. Now, if after the conquest of the area around this domain, the vanquished people were treated as were the first subjects, the state would be lost. What the conquered province would, uh, what the conquest province would send in tribute to the capital would no longer return to them. The frontiers would be ruined and consequently weakened. The people would be badly affected by this. The sustenance of the armies that were to remain there and have influence would be more precarious. Such is the necessary state of, con of a conquered monarchy. Fighting luxury in the capital, poverty in the provinces at some distance from them. In other words, this is, this is the thing. F uh, f uh, f frightful luxury at the capital, right? poverty in the province at some distance from them, abundance at the furthest points. It is at and it is as it is with our planet. Fire is in the center, greenery on the surface, and between them, an arid, cold, and sterile land. <laughs> Use the metaphor of the planet, right? The center is fire, the uh, 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 green is on the outside, and then what happens is that between there is an arid, cold, sterile land. Um, and this is the nature of this kind of uh, danger of that situation. Chapter 10, on a monarchy that conquers another monarchy. Sometimes a monarchy conquers another. The smaller uh, 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 the smaller the latter is, the better. It will be uh, uh, contained by strongholds. The larger, the better preserved by colonies. 
So therefore, the smaller strongholds, larger people colonies that people view. Chapter 11, the Moors of a Vanished People. On these conquests, it is not enough to leave the vanished nation and its laws. It is perhaps more necessary to leave its, it, uh, it, its Moors, because the people always knows and loves and defends its Moors better than its laws. This is an interesting. Moors. Moors are our social habits. Moors are the habits we have that are there. They're from the bottom. The laws can be imposed from above. So therefore, the Greek, the, the, the Greeks understood this as both laws. This is nomos. Nomos in the Greek means not only customs, but it also means this a, a law that comes like this from the rulers. Um, so therefore, this is the modern. What Montesquieu is distinguishing here between mores, which are you know mores or mores, are norms, social norms and social rules that come from the bottom up, from our habits and customs and uh, traditions. And whereas laws can come from the political rulers and our rulers. And therefore, it's better to, you know, mores are stronger than laws. I right? defend it's more law, laws better than laws. The French were driven out of Italy nine times because, say the historians, they were insolent to women and girls. Uh, it is it, it is too much for a nation to have suffer not only the, con the conqueror's pride, but also in constants, in con con continents. In other words, this idea is that they couldn't, you know, they kept on their women, they could, you know, not being able to control themselves and getting drunk and taking women out. Uh, not, only, uh, not only both of these, but also his indiscretion. Probably the more trying because it multiplies uh, outrages to infinity. In other words, this is like this. In other words, it's his, con in other words, conquerors pride, his incontinence, that means he couldn't control himself, controls other things. This would lead to indiscretions, which then lead to other problems, you know, uh, rapes and you know, thievery and things like this. And it multiplies an infinite outrage. This is the idea. This is why. <clears throat> and this led what <clears throat> to the French moving the Italians. Sorry, the Italians moving the French up. Uh, chapter 12 on the law of Cyrus. I do not consider good the law that Cyrus made, that the Lydians could exercise none but vile or infamous professions. One attends to the most urgent, one thinks of rebellions and not invasions, but invasions will come soon. The two peoples unite, they corrupt each other. I should prefer that the laws, uh, uh, that the laws, uh, I should prefer that the laws maintained the roughness of the virtue victorious people than that they kept up the softness of the vanquished people. Aristodemus, tyrant of Cameth, sought to weaken the courage of the youths. He wanted the boys to let their hair grow like, uh, 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 like, a, girl's dr uh, like a girl's, dressing it with flowers, and to wear uh, uh, various colored robes down to their heels, to have women bring them uh, uh, their parasols, perfumes, and fans when they went to dancing masters and their musical ma music masters. In the bath, women gave them their combs and mirrors. This educated education lasted until the, the age of 20. This is suitable only for a petty tyrant who risks his sovereignty in order to defend his life. So the example of this is a tyrant who did these things to keep, what is he? He risks his sovereignty. He risks his power and his control. Therefore, the, you know, in order to say, he did this to corrupt the people, prevent the courageous people from men to be killed. Chapter 13, Charles the uh, 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 twelfth. This prince, who used only his forces, brought up on his fall by form, uh, forming designs that could be executed only by a long war, one which his kingdom could not support. It was not a state in, in its decline that he attempted to overthrow, but a rising empire. The war this prince waged against the Muscovites. This is Charles of yeah, Charles of Sweden, right? This this wage against the Muscovites served them as a school. After each defeat, they came closer to victory. While losing abroad, they learned to defend themselves at home. Charles believed himself master of the world in an unintended reach, uninhabited region of Poland, where he roamed. 
and in, uh, and in which Sweden was spread out, as it were, while his principal enemy strengthened itself against him, surrounded him, established itself on the Baltic Sea, and destroyed and captured Livona, Livonia. Liv 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 okay, that's Lviv, I think. Um, Sweden was like a river whose water were cut off at the source while the course was being deflected. It was not, uh, it was not a, a Poltava that ruined Charles. If he had not been destroyed at that place, he would have been destroyed at another. Accidents of fortune are easily recited. One cannot avert eff effects that continuously arise from the nature of things. Okay, so therefore the nature of things here, this is... Um, at the, in, in 1785, the beginning of the clause was, uh, of this clause was changed from the, although in the mass edition, the punctuation has been left changed. Therefore, this is two editions, different things, the change of the things. So therefore, this is idea. But neither fortune, neither nature nor fortune was ever as strong against him as he himself. He was not ruined by the actual arrangement of things, but rather by a certain model he had chosen. He, uh, even in uh, even this, he followed badly. He was not Alexander, but he would have been Alexander's best soldier. In other words, he's not Alexander. He, in other words, it was, uh, Alexander's project succeeded only because it was sensible. The unfavorable results of the Persian invasions of Greek, Greece, the conquest of Aegilius, uh, 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 and the retreat of the 10,000 had made known just how superior the Greek, uh, the Greek manner of doing battle and their sort of weapons were, and it was well known that the Persians were too great to correct themselves. In other words, they, in other words that there's all these events, you know, the Greeks removing the, per the Persian victory, the Greek victory in the Persian War, Aglius, uh, uh, the, the, the Spartan general defeat of this, then the uh, um, uh, uh, the, the story of the um, of the 10,000, you know, that Xenophon's and Anabasis. And then uh, 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 this was shown how Greek, war, Greek arms and Greek ways of war were simply better than the Persians. And the Persians were too great and powerful and too inflexible to correct themselves. And to, they could no longer weaken Greece by dividing it. It was, uh, it was then united under a leader for whom there was no better means of hiding its servitude from it than to dazzle it by the destruction of its eternal enemies and by the ex ex expectation of conquering Asia. In other words, Alexander was unified, everything else, you know, unified, they couldn't do that, they couldn't divide the Greek. The Persians constantly played one Persian, one Greek state against the other one. This is shown at the end of you know the Peloponnesian War. Um, as the empire was cultivated by a nation of the most industrious people in the world who plowed their land on account of, of religious principle, a nation fertile and abundant in all things, it was easy uh, for an, uh, an enemy to subsist there. By the arrogance of these kings, always humbled in vain by their defeats, one might judge that they would have hastened their downfall by always giving battle and flattery would never allow them to doubt their greatness. And not only was, there pro uh, was the project wise, but it was wisely executed. Alexander, in rapidity of successions, even in the heat of passions, was led by a, vein, uh, uh, by a vein of reason, if I dare use the term. And those who have wanted to make a romance of his story, those whose spirit was more spoiled than his, had been enabled to hide it from us. Let us speak of him at length. So to, even though he starts with Charles VII saying he was a good soldier, he would have been a good soldier of Alexander, but he's, he was imitating Alexander. But Alexander, while well, uh, Charles's plan, uh, Charles the uh, plan was wrong. This didn't make sense. Um, in fact, you know, he explained why. Now, Alexander's plan made sense, and it was rational. And it, it was because, and he's saying that, that what. That, and now he's in chapter 14, he's going to talk about Alexander, right? This is the whole point. He's going to go in further about Alexander. He says, he left Greece only after securing Macedonia from its neighboring barbarian peoples and completely oppressing the Greeks. 
He used this oppression only for the execution of his enterprise. He entered, he, he, he rendered the last Macedonians jealousy powerless. He attacked the maritime provinces. He made his army follow the seashore in order not to be separated from his fleet. He used discipline uh, remarkably well against numbers. He did not lack provisions. And if it is true that victory gave him everything, he also did everything in order to gain victory. In the beginning of his enterprise, that is, at a time when a defeat could have set him back, he left little chance. When fortune set him above events, to remedy was sometimes one of his means. So, so therefore, in other, words, in other words, he left little chance. And then when fortune was uh, uh, set him above events, to remedy, that means like, you know, ah, let's go get it, was sometimes one of his means. Yeah, confidence, sorry, it's exactly true, confidence. Uh, 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 um, when he marched against the uh, uh, Trilobillians and the Assyrians before his departure, you can see a war like the one Caesar waged later in Gaul. On his way to Greece, it was almost in spite of himself that he captures and destroys Thebes. Uh, camp near the city, he waits until the Thebians want to make peace. They themselves hasten their ruin. When it is a question of battling the naval forces of the Persians, Parmeon uh, 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 is more audacious, but Alexander is wiser. By his industry, he maneuvered the Persians away from the seashore and reduced them uh, 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 to abandoning their navy, which was superior. In principle, Tyre was attached to the Persians, who could do uh, uh, not without its commerce and its navy. Alexander destroyed it. It took Egypt, which Darius left, uh, 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 which Darius had left stripped of troops, while he was collecting innumerable armies for an, uh, in another universe. Alexander owed his mastery of the Greek colonies to cross uh, uh, to the crossing of the Gracchus. To battle Eris, he gave Tyre and Egypt. He, uh, the battle he uh, at the battle of Eris gave him Tyre and Egypt. At the battle of Arbella gave him the whole earth. Uh, please forgive me. Oh, acid. Mm. Okay. After the Battle of Isis. He let Darius flee, and concerning himself only with consolidating his ruling and conquest. After the Battle of Arbella, he followed Darius so closely that he leaves him no retreat in his empire. Darius enters his town and provinces only to leave again. Alexander's marches are so rapid that you believe that empire of the universe is the prize for, run is the prize for running, as, is the Greek as in the Greek game rather than the prize for victory. It is thus that he made his conquest complete. Let us see how he preserved them. He resisted those who wanted them to treat the Greeks as masters and the Persians as slaves. He thought only of uniting the two nations and wiping out the distinctions between the conquerors and the vanquished. After the conquest, he abandoned all the prejudices that had served him in making it. He assumed the mores of the Persian not to, or in order not to distress the Persians by making them assume the mores of the Greek. This is why he sh he showed so much respect for the uh, uh, the wife and mother of Darius, and why he was so c uh, uh, content. Who is this conqueror who who is mourned by all the people he subjected? Who is this usurper uh, uh, whose death moved to tears the family he removed from the throne? This as aspect of, of his life, histories, historians tell us, can be claimed by no other conqueror. Nothing uh, strengthens a conquest more than unions by marriage between two peoples. Alexander took wives from the nations he had vanquished. He wanted the, uh, uh, the men of his court to do likewise. 
The rest of the Macedonians followed his example. The Franks, the Burgundians, allowed these marriages. In Spain, the Visigoths forbade them and later permitted them. The Lombards not only permitted them, but then, but even, uh, Lombards not only permitted them, but fostered them. So this is like, this is that of his court, right? So 16, that, this is a, 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 a variant. And Abbasis. This is the leagues of the Burgundians. This is that uh, there. Um, let's look at 19. Um, the Lex, uh, 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 like this. When the Romans wanted uh, 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 to weaken Macedonia, they established there that no union by marriage could be made between the peoples of one province to another. Alexander sought to unite the two peoples, thought of making a larger number of Greek colonies in Persia. He brought an infinite number of towns and cemented all the parts of this new empire so well that after his death and the trouble and the confusion of the most horrible civil wars, after the Greeks had annihilated themselves, so to speak, none of the Persian provinces rebelled. So therefore, the you know they, they had a civil war. The Greeks themselves had fighting. That in order in order not to drain Greece and Macedonia, he sent a colony of Jews to Alexandria. It was important for him that what moors these people had provided they were faithful to him. So he sent the Jews to Alexandria for right? the purpose of what to kind of stop. They were faithful to him, and therefore the moors didn't matter. It's, he left to the vanquished peoples not only their moors but also their civil laws, and he and even their kings and governors he had found there. He put the Macedon he put the Macedonians at the head of the troops, and the people from the invading countries at the head of the government, preferring to run the risk of the unfaithfulness of some individuals, which occurred a few times, to a general rebellion. He has respected the old traditions and everywhere uh, 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 the old tradition and everything that courted the glory of or the vanity of these people. Uh, um, the kings of Persia had destroyed the temples of the Greeks, the Babylonians and the Greeks. He, uh, 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 the Persian uh, had destroyed the temples of the uh, Greeks, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, and he rebuilt them. Right? This is that, again, the uh, 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 Arians uh, account of this in chapter three, right? Um, there were few nations whose altars he did not sacrifice. It seemed that he had conquered only to be the monarch of each nature and the first citizen of each town. The Romans conquered all in order to destroy all. They wanted to conquer all in order to preserve all. He wanted to conquer all in order to preserve all. And, and in every country he entered, his first ideas, his first design, were always to do something to increase its prosperity and its power. He found the first way of doing this in the greatest uh, in the, the greatness of his genius the second in his own fragility and his own economy and third in his immense frugality uh, for great things it was doing frugality let's do this with this make sure you understand what this word is right this is that um oh no no definition it means tight this is it means frugality means if i remember correctly it means um um kind of like the ability to do it, his immense ability to do something. This is like prodigality means the ability to do something. This, 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 the, a kind of the way to do it, like, in, you know, actually that he was able to do great things with very little in that sense, right? Um, uh, his immense priority for great things. His hands were closed for private expenditures. It opened for public expenditures. It was a question of regulating his household he was a Macedonian. Uh, uh, he was a Macedonian. Um, when, it, when, it, when it was a question of regulating, he acted in this way. Was it a question of paying soldiers' debts, of letting the Greeks share in his conquest, of making the fortune of each man his army? He was Alexander. He did two things that were bad. He burned Persepolis uh, and killed Clivus. He made the, uh, uh, them famous by his uh, his repentance. So one forgets his criminal actions and remember his respect for virtue, so that these actions are considered misfortunes rather than 
things proper to him. So that prosperity finds the beauty of his soul at virtually the same time as his raving and his weakness. So that one had to be sorry for him that it no longer possible to hate him. I shall compare him to Caesar. When Caesar wanted to imitate the kings of Asia, he drove the Romans to despair over things of pure ostentation. When Alexander tried to imitate the kings of Asia, he did everything that entered into the plan. Uh, he did he did a thing that entered into the plan of his conquest. In other words, in other words he drove the pure ostentation. He despair over the pu uh, things of pure ostentation. In other words, the Caesar imitated the kings of Asia. He drove the Romans into despair because his ostentation of it. When Alexander wanted to imitate the king, he did it. It was a part of his plan to conquest. Fifteen, a new means of preserving a conquest. When a monarch, a monarch conquests a large state, it is, admir uh, it is a, an admirable practice, equally proper for moderating despotism and for preserving the conquest. Those who conquered China put to use. In order not to drive the vanquished people to despair and not to make the victor more arrogant, it, in order to keep their government from being militarily and to hold the two peoples to their duties, the Tartar family, now reigning in China, had established that each body of troops in the province would be composed of half Chinese and half Tatar. So, I mean, the, so that, okay, in other words, the Tartar family is now reigning in China, right? Kept half his troops in the province would be composed half of Chinese and half Tartar, so that the jealousy between the two nations would hold them to their duties. They're checking, checking, right? In other words, the two peoples. In other words, not to not to uh, drive this, the vanquished people into. In other words, again, let's let's go over this again. I got interrupted, and I probably thanks. In other words, he talks about this about a monarch conquers a large state, marble practice. In other words, those who conquer China is the good example, right? Because they want to put China to use. In order to not to drive the vanquished people to despair, not to make the victor arrogant, in order to keep the government from being military, he hold two people to their duty. The Tartar family, now reigning in China, established that each body of troops in the province should be composed half Chinese and half Tartars. So the jealousy of the two nations will hold them to their duties. So divide and conquer, right? Divide, check, and check, and check. The tribunals are likewise half Chinese and half Tartar. This produces many good results. One, the two nations consist, constrain each other and both keep military and civil power. Keep, uh, both keep military and civil power. And one is not wiped out by the other. The conquering nation can spread throughout, uh, throughout without weakening and ruining itself. It becomes capable of resisting uh, the uh, civil and foreign wars. This is a much sensible institution that uh, 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 that the abstinence of of a like one had led to the ruin of almost all the conquerors of the earth. In other words, the, 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 the Tartar who conquers the Chinese made a good rule, but he, now he will say this is a good rule. It worked, but it didn't because it changes the Tartars completely. We'll say later. Um, uh, chapter 16, on the despotic state that conquers. An immense conquest presupposes despotism. In this case, the army that is spread out in the province uh, 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 is, is insufficient. Uh, there must always be a specifically trustworthy body among the prince, always ready to as, uh, assail the parts of the empire that never wavers. In other words, you have the despotic state must be a group of people that is that can always go out there to assail the parts that wavers. This god should contain the others, and make uh, uh, and make tremble all those whom one has been obliged to leave some authority in the empire. So therefore, there in other words, this god should contain the others and uh, make tremble all those. This guard is so hard, scary that it, it, the, anyone that you've given authority to the out anywhere in the empire should be like, oh my God, right? A decent authority in the empire. Around the emperors of China, a massive body of Tartars always stand ready in case of need. Among the Mongols, among the Turks, and, and in Japan, there is a body in the prince's pay, independent of ones maintained by the revenue from the land. These special forces keep the general ones respectful. Was this, these are, this is a, this is a despotic state that conquered this, this, this special force 
that's only loyal to the ruler. It just keeps it like that, you know, keeps it in check. Chapter 17, continuation syndrome. We have said that states conquering the, by despotic monarch should be feudatory. History, historians tire themselves praising the generosity of conquerors who have returned the crown to princes whom they have vanquished. Therefore, the Romans who made kings everywhere in order to have instruments of servitude were quite generous. Such an action is, ne is a necessary act. If the conqueror keeps the conquered state, the governors he sends will not be able to constrain the subjects, nor will he his governors. Okay, so therefore he won't, the governors won't be able to constrain the conquered states, and he won't be able to constrain the governors. He will be obliged to strip his first patrimony of troops in order to safeguard the new ones. So, it, 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 uh, 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 in other words, he will strip his first patrimony of troops and to save the new, new troops. Right? All the misfortunes of all the misfortunes, the two states will be shared. Civil war of the one will be the civil war of the other. But if, on contrary, the conqueror returns the throne to the legitimate prince, he will necessarily have an ally with his own forces, will increase those of the, con uh, uh, the conqueror. As we have seen uh, uh, Shah Nad Nadir conquer the treasures of the Mongols and leave Hind Hindustan to him. So therefore, this is the example from that, that Shah uh, uh, conquered the Mongols, but leave the Hindustan to them. In other words, didn't take it off. So therefore, you conquer. This is this idea. This is how this ends. This this idea of a conqueror, and a despotic state. He, what he conquers, but then that just makes the monarch go. He turns the thing to him and say, makes him an ally. Um, and this ends the uh, 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 book uh, uh, ten. So we'll stop here. Um, if you have any questions, please put them below. Uh, if you liked it, like it, like it, share it with friends, share it with, uh, 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 on social media, on just Twitter and anywhere to get people attention to this. Um, another thing you can do is uh, you, if you're not subscribed, subscribe, get another subscribe. So you know, we want to grow the channel a little bit more. Um, if you have uh, disliked, okay, you didn't like, you, there's a problem with the video or you don't like something I said here, I've got something wrong. I apologize. I kind of got interrupted by a phone call, and I had to turn the thing off, and I got kind of confused near the end for a second, and I kind of repeated myself maybe. But this helps. Uh, uh, I think uh, if you have a problem, you can say what's wrong and uh, make suggestions. Um, and if you think I did something, I made a mistake, correct me. Okay, this is the goal for this. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, uh, uh, the links are below. If you want to help me doing this by financially, you know, you want to contribute something, you do something, you can do so by Patreon and subscribe star memberships there, or you can buy one of my books listed there below. Okay, that's it. I hope everyone does well. See us next time. Remember, uh, every uh, under this new series, we're doing it Monday, Wednesdays. Then I'm going to be doing something else on Tuesdays, Thursdays. But Fridays is the light at Fridays at the time of release, which is six o'clock. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. or uh, 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 noon time Eastern Standard Time. So, uh, the, the release videos usually happen at noon time Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. or at 6 p.m. Central European Time. So that's it. Take care. See you soon. Bye bye. Have a good one.